Now, Holly spoke at AV1 back in Totnes, uh, which was a little over eight years ago now, in um, April of uh, uh, 2008. And... Holly gave an absolutely stunning presentation on food for consciousness. And I contacted Holly, and uh, I think within sort of five minutes of me leaving a message, she called back and said she was available. And I asked her what she wanted to talk about. And she said, well, it's got to be food. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's great. So, and, and interestingly, like I said, there tends to be a theme, a thread. And you'll see this for yourself, obviously, as it goes through. And you'll see the connection that Holly has to offer with what James was talking about just now. So Holly's title is Neuroactive Food. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Holly Page. Thank you. So... Um, I was absolutely delighted to be called by Ian um, to do this talk, and um, it's such a such an ideal place to talk about this subject matter. And um, this is this subject, neuroactive nutrition, is something. It's, this, this is the passion of my life. So obviously, I'm biased into how important I think it is, but I still think it really is because it's the biochemical basis of our perception and how we see things and how we perceive ourselves and how we see the problems and how we see the solutions and become capable of implementing them. So when I spoke at AV1, um, I had a really positive reception, but still at that time, I think a lot of people in the world at large weren't really ready to hear about this and now I'm astonished everywhere I go and mention this in conversation people immediately seem to get it and it's just so encouraging and um, I'm, going to I'm going to refer to notes because it was just a few days ago I heard I was coming to speak here I have one slide and I'm going to say first of all what I think neuroactive nutrition is and I'm going to say what it is not um, so neuroactive nutrition, it's what we are designed as humans to eat that builds our neural systems, that generates our neural systems, that generates neuro, that's used to build our neurotransmitters. And um, it also, it, um, it's the biochemicals that interact with our own internal biochemistry to affect our, to make our perception as it's optimal. And um, it's, the, it's the biological diet of our species that we seem to have forgotten about. Um, it provides the fuel for our brains to work. Now, I talk about our brains, I talk our neural, about our neural systems. For me, I, my thing is to step back and see nutrition and our brains and our way of perceiving things in a, in a much bigger concept. So I don't go into huge details. There's plenty of people who are going into details um, from this point of view. I'm, try I'm trying to provide a context, and that's, that's really my job, is to try and make decades of research by many people simple and in context. Everything I talk about in this talk is backed up scientifically, referenced somewhere. You can find references to everything I talk about from my website, foodforconsciousness.com, at the bottom. Right at the bottom, there's um, a link called Holly's Blogspot, and everything I talk about is referenced there. There's links to um, research from a wide variety of people. And um, the main text for this information about nutrition and the neural system comes out of the work of um, Tony Wright, um, and it's documented in a book called Return to the Brain of Eden, which I've got copies of out there, and you can also buy from my site. So just to make it clear, this is all... I'm going to make some quite bold statements, but they're all backed up in, in research. Um, so I'm going to distinguish from psychoactive nutrition. I used to like talking about psychoactive nutrition because I was making my point that food is psychoactive. Whatever type of food we eat, it's psychoactive. You know, if you eat, if you eat slices of white bread, it's, like, it's, well, it's psycho-deadening, but it, all food affects our psyches. Um, but now I don't feel I need to make that dramatic point. I think people have got that. But also, we've got an interesting new development, the Psychoactive Substances Act... The very How many people have heard of that act? 
So it's, it's very, very interesting because it's, this is the first country, the UK is the first country now where the government is banning all substances that have a psychoactive effect unless they are or food that is deemed we already eat or it's caffeine or tobacco or alcohol. I think that's the list. There might be a few other, a few other substances. So it's a really interesting act. And in fact, when it first, it was supposed to come into force earlier this year, but the police said they could not enforce it. You know, how, uh, what does it actually mean? I mean, it means nearly everything becomes illegal. Um, so I thought it's all gone away, but now it is coming to force on the 26th of May. So I, I, from my understanding, nobody seems to quite understand what it means, because it's so vague, but from what I can make of it, you can still possess um, herbs and so forth that are psychoactive, but you can't sell them or import them. Now, how this is going to play out, I have no idea, but I wish to distance myself now, myself now from the word psychoactive, because when I first heard this, I thought everything I talk about is now illegal. <laughs> so, I think, you know, so, no, this is neuroactive. This is all very sensible. It's about us opti uh, operating optimal levels, being extremely functional, which it is, and be able to work productively, work at optimal capacity. This is all extremely sensible and healthy. And it's true. And the state of ecstatic cognition is a highly functional one. And it always was for humans until comparatively not that long ago. So I'm going to talk about how I came to this, um, what actually neuroactive nutrition is in a practical sense, and what we can go and do from now um, to help ourselves become clearer and, and know who we are um, in terms of our, bio our biochemical basis. I came to this from a really simple um, desire to be happy because I had everything, there's a certain point in my life, had everything I thought I was supposed to want that would make me happy. And I was really shocked and disturbed that I wasn't, and there was more to it than this. And I went on this kind of quest for the Holy Grail, as people, uh, some of my family described it in slight disgust, um, <laughs> and actually found the answers I was looking for. I wanted to find out what would actually make me have that feeling of feeling right and feeling happy. And I had no idea where it was going to come from. I explored through very spiritual tra traditions and so forth. And then I had a hunch to go down to move down to the southwest of England. And there I heard about, first of all, I was hearing about raw food and the effect, it, the way it made you feel. So I got into the whole raw food thing, which I was very much into when I did the first, when I did the AV1 talk. And I'm still passionate about raw food, but I very much think you don't have to eat all raw food to have this feeling. Um, but um, I got into the whole raw food thing and I, was, I decided to eat all my food raw and see what happened. And after three days, I just had this sudden transformation of feeling. I felt like I was a child again, like I was a child in the garden. It was just literally like coming up. And I was like, wow, you know. So I've got to carry on with this. So then I had three questions. You know, why does it make me feel like this? Because people at that time were talking a lot about enzymes. I'm sure this isn't enzymes. This is something else. This is something that's happening to my brain. And the other question is, how am I going to sustain this? Because it's quite a nutritional challenge to sustain that kind of diet, as a lot of people have found out. And the third is, how can I, how can I take this further? How can I feel even more amazing? So it's, you know, it's been a long journey, and I've been on a long journey since Alternative View 1, um, as has Alternative View. But um, the answers I was looking for did come from the work by, of Tony Wright, um, as documented in Return to the Brain of Eden. And the answers were so, so simple. And it's like a wonder that you know, we don't hear about this kind of thing more often. Basically, our neural system, after water, is comprised mainly of fat. Now, we get, I think, so I'm just going to backtrack a little bit to talk about Something, I think there's a kind of programming in our minds that has happened, and it's so deep that even if we've rejected this theory, the way of thinking is deeply inculcated into our psyches, and that's Darwinian selection. So this idea that every adaptation that humans has made has somehow been beneficial and helped us become the, the people we are today, yay. And, um, and even people who've rejected um, the... Some of, the, some, of the, some of the conclusions of, that have come out of um, Darwinian theory, still we have this deeply in, embeddedness that everything's basically being progress and that everything we do is an adaptation. You know, and that eating big roast dinners or steak and kidney pies or something is truly an adaptation that makes us more able to survive. 
Um, I think there's some truth in it, in that, but it's not quite, not quite, um, not quite the way that we sort of imagine. So, if you think about the natural habitat of humans, the place where we can easily get all the food that we need, we have shelter. Like other animals, they have their natural habitats where all their needs are met. It seems like our natural habitat is not at latitudes like this, where there's hardly any food that we eat growing, but places, for example, in the forests of the tropics, where we've got lots of abundant fruit and herbs and other substances that we can eat, where the, the climate is, the temperature is ideal for our situation. We don't need to wear clothes, we don't need shelter and so forth. It's all provided for us. Now, it doesn't mean to say that we want to go back to that or that even that would be a good thing, but it gives us a lot of clues about what our needs are as a species. So... Um, when we left that environment, which clearly we did, um, and nearly all humans have left that environment, and even the humans who still live in those environments have probably left, have left that environment at some point, our biochemistry changed radically because we're eating different things in a different situation. And the implications of that are really huge because the way that we are made up, our neural systems and our brains, our digestive systems, our endocrine systems and so forth, um, it's not just the DNA, information in the DNA, it's the way the DNA is transcribed or read. And that's now coming out more in the study of epigenetics. So although we may still have the same DNA as humans who lived their natural biological habitat, we actually built really quite differently. And our brains have become different. Our, we have a split sense of self because our left hemisphere has become quite different to our right hemisphere. Again, you know, this, our ideas about left and right hemisphere are still really left over from the 1960s with the work of Roger Sperry, but there's been a lot of work in recent decades that suggests that there's something quite different going on. They're not specialist brains. They're actually... Um, that the right hemisphere holds a lot of function that has been lost, lost by the left. So you can find, you can find reference to, references to all this work on my website. But um, So we've got a situation where we've got a left hemisphere that's dominant, that's more like a linear logic machine, and all the imagination and creativity and inspiration and all these sort of almost supernatural, um, supernatural abilities that we naturally have as humans locked away in the right hemisphere and not accessible. Um, our digestive systems are... Be, or partially, accept, partially um, accessible. Our digestive systems are built differently so that now we couldn't even digest the natural food of our species. So even to trying to return to it, we're thinking about blending and changing it in various ways, fermenting it or whatever. Um, and our endocrine system has changed and our pineal gland has become... Um, it's not pumping the hormones and other biochemicals that it's designed to. So... Um, naturally, our pineal gland pumps tiny amounts of DMT, which is an essential neurotransmitter, enables us to see patterns and see solutions to problems. Um, it should be pumping large amounts of melatonin day in, day out, maybe more at night, but certainly a lot in the day too. That changes the way the DNA is read, and it modulates our sex hormones. Um, and also a monoamine oxidase inhibitors, which boost neurotransmitter levels, and our pineal gland isn't doing that the way that it's designed to. Um, so we've had a lot of changes, and it's changed our sense of who we are, so we live in a world of concepts now, rather than actually energetically feeling everything. So that's, that's basically the story of how we've kind of, from a biochemical point of view, become how we are. So, um, for example, something to think about, a primate, look, Catherine Milton, primatologist studying primates in the wild, uh, estimates that we've lost over 95% of the micronutrients that we would have living in the wild setting. So we're only having, we're having less than 5% of the micronutrients of another primate living in the wild, and they haven't got nearly as complex neural systems as we've got. We're so nutritionally challenged, it's just, we, we can't even see it because we're so nutritionally challenged. Um, so having left our ideal environment, we've been in a survival 
We've been in a survival situation ever since. So we've, we've very adaptable species. Now, a panda taken from the bamboo forest would just stop eating, and it would certainly would not reproduce. But we're so our enthusiasm and our ability to carry on has meant we've taken all kinds of plants that have got masses of toxins in them. We found we can cook them, ferment them, and still get some nutrition out of them. We've even um, piggybacking other animals in places we found ourselves. For example, in a latitude like this, um, we're using. Um, we're using cows, goats, who's taking their milk because, or, or even eating their flesh um, because th they can, um, they're adapted to this environment. They're out there naked, grazing, eating lots of herbs and insects and able to make nutrition. So because we can't really operate the way we're designed to, we're, we've been clever enough to get into a relationship with other animals. And this is, this is all, our, you know, all our survival strategies. But we've paid, we've paid the price in having a seriously compromised neural system. While I'm on the subject of, of this, what, what actually, what is our ide ideal diet, um, it's worth mentioning Weston Price, um, a dentist in the 1930s who visited a variety of a variety of peoples who lived in places where the road still hadn't reached, who were still basically optimistic, had well-formed faces, hardly any problems with their teeth, and so forth, no degenerative disease. And he found that although people in different parts of the world, in different kind of climates, at very, at, on first sight, at very differently, they all had a lot of commonalities. Not surprisingly, they all ate a lot of raw food. They all had... Um, they all had access to good water. Um, they all ate a lot of fat-soluble vitamins. Um, they all ate actually ate animal products, although less so in um, tropical climates. Um, they did that for, the, and they all had special diets for women and, and young children, and or women of reproductive age and young children and, and babies and pregnant women, um, which were very rich in fat-soluble vitamins. So it seems like, it seems like um, humans now, removed from their biological habitat with our digestive systems changed, like we need, um, we need what we need as humans, but we also need a special diet that we can digest. And also now we need a doubly special diet because of the situation that we find ourselves in. For example, we're living in a radioactive soup, so we're thinking about taking an extra iodine, making sure we've got enough iodine, making sure that we're taking something like zeolites to flush out heavy metals, radioactive elements. So, so it's sort of a three-pronged approach, getting our human diet, getting the diet we need to take into account that our digestive systems are compromised, and three, to take into account this polluted soup that, that we're living in. Um, and then we've got the issue of um, our right hemisphere being, um, being suppressed and our pineal gland being suppressed too. So this is where the, um, the phenomenon of microdosing comes in. I, I was, um, I've been microdosing for over a decade and I used to keep very quiet about it because I, think, cause I felt people didn't understand and they didn't understand that it makes you more functional. But I'm realizing now that in America, this is becoming very well known and it's respectable. It's done by athletes. It's done by people in Silicon Valley because it's about taking in various um, biochemicals that will stimulate um, the right hemisphere and also stimulate that whole system that's been shut down involving the pineal gland and the right hemisphere and giving us back the biochemicals that actually should be there in the first place. So um, I'm not going to talk too much about that now, about all of them, except uh, the only, there's only one plant I'm going to talk about because we've got limited time here. Um, but we are, we are designed to live in a symbiotic relationship with the plant world. The very fact that we are originally frugivores, that meant that we were seeking out fruits that would make us... Because fruit make when you've got a clean body and your, and your whole system is working the way it should, fruit actually makes you high. We're naturally seeking out food that makes us high. That is why we want to eat. I think a lot of times now we can get so, um, when we lose our energy or even the stomach's contracting, we call that hunger. But I think the natural desire to eat is more desire to get high. It's like, wow, that piece of fruit's going to make me feel amazing. That's going to make me feel amazing. And that experience is going to make me feel amazing. And doing this is going to make me feel amazing. And I think we've all, we've, actually largely forgotten that as humans, that that's what we're here for, every moment to feel more and more amazing. And that is hand in hand with having our cognitive faculties working properly. They're two, one and the same thing. Um, 
So we've got this natural relationship originally with the fruit trees, um, seeking the nicest piece of fruit that will make us feel the most amazing. You know, the more we eat of that, the more of its seeds get spread, that tree spreads. So we're really, our biochemistry and the biochemistry of those trees and those fruits, it's like one thing. It's this one synergetic, synergistic whatever the word is, um, relationship. And then later on, as we lost that, you know, we, know, we know how we're meant to feel. We sought out other plants, various herbs and mushrooms that would get some of that feeling back. And we still, you know, we still got that going on. You know, a lot of people still got that going on today. And now we're thinking, you know, now there's medicinal plants. I'm only going to talk about one of them. Um, there's what, um, and for a very, very particular reason. Um, when we start to... When we start to um, eat the way we're designed to and get our neural system working properly. So we're getting in the, um, the undamaged fatty acids that we need to build our brain to full spec. We're getting an undamaged amino acids. Most neurotransmitters are made from amino acids. That's something we're not told. That's protein, but undamaged, undamaged by heat, undamaged by protein. We're taking in um, flavonoids, which are compounds you find in fruit and vegetables, which modulate our chemistry. When you start taking in all these undamaged elements, which, which means a lot of raw food, but it's, we're talking about undamaged um, nutritional elements, and you, start, and you start to take out the deadening foods, like all the rancid fats and the, and the heavy cooked proteins and stuff like wheat, or, and you know, all these mood suppressors, take them out, you put in the, the elements that we really need to feel really amazing, and then we start to feel a lot more. And then we start to, you, we start to think a bit differently because you realize that everything you think and say is, is affecting how you feel. And if you want to feel good, you're going to start wanting to think about things that make you feel great and say things that make you feel good and the people around you good. So you're on that. So, I mean, I was at that point for a long, long while, but I was still very, very, very puzzled um, because um, this business of all the negative thinking that goes on, and I was like, what the heck is it? Because we know it doesn't achieve anything. We know that it just makes us feel miserable. It doesn't seem to empower us to do anything. I mean, there's a point, there's a time for seeing what's, where there's a problem. That's a very difficult thing. But the going around the same loop, complaining about things, criticizing about things, and being despondent, what is the point? And then, you know, I'd even start to think, you know, I was realizing it's addictive, and then, but that doesn't solve it, because we all know that if you know you're addicted to something, doesn't mean you can stop being addicted to it that easily. So about that time, serendip through serendipity, I found myself um, connected to the world of Ibogaine. How many people have heard of Ibogaine or Iboga? Right, so mo I think most people in this country haven't heard about it. So what Ibo Iboga is a plant um, in Africa. It's been used as long as anyone can remember as an initiatory plant medicine. So people use it, it's used in rites of passage, also for healing. Um, but it was discovered by accident way back in 1962 that um, by um, a heroin addict in New York called Howard Lotsov, that um, it, it cuts through addiction. Um, nearly all addictions, as far as I know, heroin, cocaine, alcohol, um, all, kinds of, all kinds of drugs, and it would just cut through it in one. It resets the receptors, and it resets the neurotransmitter levels. And so it's becoming increasingly popular now, especially um, the tr uh, treatment centers have set up in Mexico, Costa Rica, Thailand, and so forth to help people with drug addictions. But what I was intrigued about is that not when people have gone through treatment, not only is their, their addiction gone, but I've been told by many people, and this observed, that they, they have very little desire to um, think negatively. So that's it. And then it became so obvious. You know, we're, we're actually addicted to the chemistry of our emotions. And that, that's documented in a book um, called Molecules of Emotion by Candace Pert. She talks about this. So even, you know, we can learn all this new stuff. We can, we can learn what's going on in the world, what we need to do and what we need to eat and all these things. But actually, we're still, we only know how to operate. This is the best way I can think of to explain it. We only know, uh, know how to operate in an emotional state that we're familiar to. And if we lose that, we actually, that creates a whole set of anxiety of its own. And it, it's, it's, the implications of this are astonishing. 
Um, and then I started um, been working with people doing, um, who've been doing ibogaine treatments and people who've been microdosing with iboga as well. Taking a, this, is, this is the one plant I want to talk about right now because I've only got a certain amount of time. And watching the same results every time that people are lifting out of all this weight of emotion and actually starting to live their lives, the lives that they've claimed all along that they wanted. And then seeing that the ancestral trauma, most of us are still living the patterns of ancestral trauma that go back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And we're just reliving it and don't know how to get out of it because we, we're so used to this f familiar state of operating. I'm very, very excited about this. I'm very excited about this plant, but I'm also very aware that there's sustainability issues with it. So there's a big question mark because more of it needs to be ready grown. But it's the point is, really, and there might well be more plants, there might well be more plant remedies that will do the same thing. I just, I haven't found what they are yet. But you think about how we're living here. I mean, we've been, as a species, you could argue we've been in trauma for many, many thousands and thousands of years. You know, we probably left the forests up to 200,000 years ago. But then in terms of more recent trauma, um, it's interesting being on the American continent. I spent a lot of time in Mexico in the last year, and they, they still talk about the conquest 500 years ago. Um, and you know that was a big change for them. But they are not as deep in it as we are. We were conquered 2,000 years ago for people who come from you know, who, whose ancestry goes back here. We were conquered. We were tribes here 2,000 years ago living on the land, and we were conquered. And we, we, pe we go around like a conquered people. It's like this sort of, you know, we're just all under it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, and, and we're still, it's not our fault. The chemistry gets, it gets carried forward epigenetically, generation after generation, and being brought up by our parents who were brought up by their parents, and it goes back to being conquered when we were already compromised already. So, but I'm really excited because it feels like there's a way we can shift it and start to actually live the lives of our dreams and not just of our own individual dreams. And this is sort of a slightly interesting thing I've been experiencing recently um, is that we have observational consciousness and we have our imagination, but there's also a sense of being imagined and um, being imagined by something much bigger than us, divine intelligence that, can, that actually gives us life beyond what we can even generate of our own. It gives us the life from the life force. So we, we live by stories. Humans live by stories. So whatever amazing things we do and however well we live our lives, if we don't think about what our stories are as humans and also as individuals, we're going to be living other stories. And you watch this again and again and again, just living this story that is, isn't what we want. It's not just even enough to have um, thoughts about what we want or dreams or goals. It's a narrative. We, we, we are a narrative species. We live with narratives. So it's think, rethinking our personal mythology, what we actually want and what, where we see it all going. Personally, I think that although for sure um, there's, um, there's groups that are causing a lot of problems for humans and a lot of it is of supernatural origin, I'm sure, um, but I still think they're not as powerful as the life force. I think the life force is way more powerful than anything that can be thrown at us. So one of our, the most important things we can do is to reconnect with a life force in every aspect of our lives. And that includes the planet Earth through which we experience most of the life force when we're here as humans, through actual electrical connection, barefoot on the ground, or at least with some kind of earthing sheet or mat or something, and actually tuning into the bioelectrical magnetic aura of the Earth. and then. If you've got natural living foods with a living structure inside you and you're doing that and you're aware and you're listening out for it and listening to the birds and listening to the sounds of nature and, and willing to admit that a lot of the things that you've been thinking about are actually just the, the, um, the result of ancestral trauma that goes back hundreds and thousands of years and then we can really start to have a life worth living on this planet. So, what do I want to... I don't know. How, how long have I got left? Plenty. Plenty. Oh, God, I just talked too fast. Is oh, great. Well, I can, I can have some questions then. But what, before, I, before I do that, I want to... Um, I, I would say, you know, what, what, things, what are things I can offer, you know, from, from here? What things you can look at? What things you can read or do? So, I've got two websites with information on. Like, the first one, foodforconscious.com. There's a blog... Holly's blog spot at the bottom. I put everything over years that I found that's relevant to this. Um, 
I also do, I can offer nutritional consultations to get to look at what, what you're eating, take out what is really a problem, think of what to replace it with, what else to throw in. I'm no longer of the view that really, if we're serious about it, we have to eat all our food raw, although that was a good start, because there's so many cooked foods you can bring in um, that are really beneficial, that aren't a problem, and also all the herbs that you can bring in. And, so I th and, and also that, you know, for most people, you know, some people can manage without animal foods, but for most people, it can be very, very challenging. So thinking of sensible ways to go about that. Um, and, I and I teach classes on, on neuroactive nutrition, also including making amazing, beautiful, gorgeous recipes, including learning how to make fermented foods. And um, the way I'm doing that at the moment is if I ask people to get a group together and a venue, it could even be someone's kitchen, and I can come for the day and teach that. This is all on the website. And um, we've got our first Edenic States retreat happening in September in Mexico. So Edenic States is my new project, and it's the premise that we all have the capacity to live in an Edenic state, which is a sense of living in paradise on Earth, which is our birthright. And it's all to do with recreating the neurochemistry and the feeling in us, in us that we actually are aware of that. And, and, and we can live that lifestyle, even though, at the same time, it's in the times we're in, it's still a battle. At the same time, it's a battle to do that. Um, but we can still happily do that as, as kind of warriors, really, but still <laughs> a Denic warriors, <laughs> a Denic empire. <laughs> so that's, that's, my, that's my talk. So can I just open it up to questions? You may. Yeah. Holly Page. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I first met Holly, I, was, I had been doing a series of talks around the country on Codex Alimentarius. Oh, yeah. Uh, and sadly, <laughs> of course, uh, everything that we were talking about with mm. Codex Alimentarius, everything has come to pass. Yeah, yeah for sure. And more. And more, a lot yeah. more. And yes. they're piling more in. Psychoactive Substances Act. Yeah, I but know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I was travelling around with Scott Tipps, who was the president of the National Health Federation, and, of course, he's also um, uh, sits on the Codex Alimentarius Commission, um, but he's not allowed a vote. He's uh, a, a consultant, if you like, an interested party. And all through the years 2007, 8, 9, mm. and 10, mm. uh, we were trying to get natural health and um, natural food groups mm. interested in the subject and no takers. And then The Independent ran a front page article on, I think it was the 1st of December 2011, announcing that from the following May, the two-year consultation period would commence, after which all natural health products and natural food products would have to be licensed. Mm. Mm. You know, it's and people don't, we just forget so quickly how things have changed, because you forget how things used to be, and you forget the things that we used to be able to get hold of that we can't anymore. <laughs> exactly. It just becomes normal. How, how many people here, I mean, when I grew up, uh, in the sort of, yeah, yeah mm. last century. <laughs> <laughs> but my, we didn't have a fridge until 1962. Mm. And then we had one that was this high in the garden because it was the snow. And I can remember my mother burying food in mm. the snow. Mm. But all the food used to come from the local market garden. And my mother used to go up there li literally every, every other day and yeah. get the food. And it was fresh food. Yeah. But how many people today eat fresh food? on a regular basis. <laughs> this is a it's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's great. But it's, yeah, people here are very aware, aren't they? They are, they are. Yeah. And I've got to tell you, after um, we met at AV1, yeah. I went to Sweden to do a series of talks on Codex, mm -hmm. and I stayed with a couple of um, uh, people who were raw foodies, so mm -hmm. raw foodie, they got rid of their cooker. Mm -hmm. and, and I'd heard Holly's talk, and I thought, well, you know, it can't be all that bad, can it? So I went and stayed with them for four days, yeah. and uh, it was great. I mean, but mm. I was the guest, and they were up at sort of stupid o'clock in the morning making the, you know, hemp milk for breakfast and everything else. Anyway, we'd been doing this for four days, and the wife, and I know because this is being videoed, I know I'm going to get somebody into a lot of trouble here. <laughs> but uh, the wife, Lisa, who was the prime mover mm. here, uh, she would get the food, and she had to go on a business trip. And that night, uh, Pear, her husband, Pear, her husband, said, uh, so Ian, uh, this is my Swedish accent, so Ian, uh, he said, uh, tonight, uh, maybe uh, we go out? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah, there's a raw food restaurant in town. <laughs> and he went, no. Uh, <laughs> we, we have pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> but maybe Lisa doesn't need to know. <laughs> oh, yeah, that is so typical. <laughs> so, yeah. So let's uh, see some questions. We have a question for Holly, anywhere. That's Joe. Joe. Hi. Great talk, thank you. Uh, I was just wondering about iboga. Uh, at the moment, I'm a therapist and I'm getting people coming to me mm. with addiction challenges. Yeah. And it's of very big interest to me if yeah. there's a solution there. So how can you get it? How can you grow it? Well, if people are talking about quite heavy addictions, they really... I mean, it's only, it's only be fair for me to say that they need a flood dose of ibogaine, and it's really... I can only recommend it done under medical supervision mm -hmm. because there are risks, but they're identifiable, and with proper medical checks, it can be completely avoided. But there have been deaths, you know, because you've got to get... A full, you've got to get enough to really slice through the addiction, but not so much that it's too much, and also make sure there's nothing in the system that um, would, you know, that would, you know, could be fatal at the, if it's at the same time. So, but, you know, some people do um, iboga microdosing. I, it depends what the addiction is, but if it's quite a heavy addiction, I would get them to go to Mexico and have a treatment, really. And there's nothing else I could sensibly say. Do, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Mm. Middle here. Well, I say, you know, the thing is, um, you say they say about ibo ibogaine and ibogaine and ibogo. Iboga, it's like 20 years of therapy, 20 years of psychotherapy in one night. You know, it goes, it works through the whole lot of it. Jennifer. Uh, yes, um, I've been reading about uh, things like Alzheimer's mm -hmm. due to calcification of the pineal gland. So what food can we eat on a regular basis that will keep pineal. our pineal gland healthy? Oh, I, I, I think there isn't just one... I can't see... Where's, where's, who am I speaking to? Oh, hi. You've got the light in your eyes. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I wish I could just say there's a magic food or magic answer, but I think, to be honest... <laughs> We actually need to, you know, we have to re really readdress the whole way that we eat and use herbs and supplements and live. And I, I just would be lying if I could say otherwise. Said otherwise. I mean, there is. I suppose there's one particular thing about thing to think about is iodine. That we're nearly all deficient in iodine. It's needed by every gland in the body, including the pineal gland. And um, it's that's partly through deficiency in iodine that things like fluoride and chlorine can actually even get in there because they've got a similar structure called halogens. So when the body's short of iodine, it latches onto chlorine and fluoride, which is why those things are so dangerous. And also radioactive iodine. So we've got to get... Uh, iodine is one thing. Yeah, I iodine. Mm. OK, just behind uh, Jennifer, Theo or Rob? Um, would you swim in a chlorinated pool? I, have, I do occasionally, yeah. Um, how would you recommend taking iodine? Mm. Uh, what, what method would you recommend to take um, iodine? Well, I mean, you can, there's Lugol's iodine. I mean, if you're more fussy, nascent iodine a bit, costs a bit more, but it's a bit, more, it's a bit better. It's a less challenging system. Um, yeah, I, I, just take, I just take drops. On your, on your tongue? Yeah, in water every day. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's obviously best not to sling, swim in chlorinated water. I personally do once a week because I've got a pool nearby that's not as heavily chlorinated as most pools are. And to be honest, the Bennett, it's weighing one, this is it, we've got to accept when we're living in this hugely compromised situation, exercise is so important. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I sometimes think, actually, if I had to choose between good diet and, exercise and no exercise and, and lots of exercise and... Do you know what I mean? I might even choose exercise, and we forget, because nothing works without exercise. So I do, I, yeah. I, but I think if we get plenty of iodine in us, we are, protect, we are quite, I think we're quite protected. But n nearly everybody is iodine deficient because it's gone from the soil. And, and um, mm. do you feel that salt and saturated fats have a bad rep? We need saturated fats. Um, and the ideal one is coconut oil. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then, and then for cooking, we should only if we are, you know, for cooking, we should only use saturated fats because they're stable. We definitely need them. It's all we've had a huge psyop done on our, mm. you know, imaginations. We need every type of fat. We need saturated fat. We need the polyunsaturated fats, definitely unprocessed and mm. definitely unheated. You know, and the omega threes, we need AF, what's it, ALA. We need DHA. We need EPA. All undamaged. We need to take them in, you know, nearly every day. Um, and the mono and 
saturated fats like you'd find in um, good quality olive oil and avocados. So you know, our neural system after water is comprised mainly of fat. And the low fat thing is an absolute disaster. Mm. You know, we need, we need lots of good fats. And there's a reason why humans crave fats and sugars, because we blimmin' need them. Do, do you know what? We need good fats, and we need the natural sugars that we'd find in fruits and vegetables. It, we just had our heads so badly addled over diet. It's just, you, you, know, you know about this, don't you? The, di the dietocrats and everything. It's, yeah, and um, so you were saying salt about... Salt as well. Salt, yeah, yeah. good quality um, sea salt. Mm. Yeah, because um, it's got a lot of trace minerals in it. Yeah. Not loads of it, but definitely a bit. I, I use that every single day. It's ref it's the problem is the refined things, the refined sugars and the refined salts, because then they draw minerals out of the body to process them when they, actually should, they should come with those minerals with them. We're all really deficient in minerals unless we're doing something about it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, there's uh, just, just slightly... There you go, Paul, just the gentleman in front of you there. Great talk. Uh, Thank you. Just terrific. Um, wait, wait, I can't see where you are. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is uh, Zen Gardener, by the way. Oh, I'm, well. I'm a shadow person. <laughs> you mentioned zeolite as, yeah. a, as a detox supplement. Yeah. Could you talk more about how these various products work yeah. and what you'd recommend for de detoxification and, and chelation therapies? I don't, know, I, I don't know off the top of my hand where I'd actually recommend anyone to go, but in terms of actually mm -hmm. removing toxins, I think, um, I mean, I, I talk about chlorella and zeolite. The chlorella is really good yeah. as well, and it pulls out heavy metals. Zeolite has got this kind of cage-like structure, and it, it draws in heavy metals and radioactive elements, mm -hmm. and I think to a degree pesticides as well, and it doesn't seem to take nutrition out of the body. It just sort of flushes it out. I was discovered about the time of Chernobyl, I think. It was one of the remedies used after Chernobyl. Do you know, is it something you, a subject you know quite a bit about yourself? No, no, I use the product. Yeah. I also wonder about, there's a liquid form in drops and you can also get the powdered. Yeah, I, I, you find I'm, a difference? I, I, I think the powder, I prefer the powder and you can get fine powder. I do, I, a lot of my, what I know about things is based on not just my own experience, but it's just talking to endless amounts of people and how, what they did, what they took, how they felt, how it affected their health. And I've always had much better feedback about the powder than the liquid. Personally, when I use the powder, I feel my head clear within minutes. Mm -hmm. I've never had that with the liquid. I mean, I'm still open to hearing otherwise, but I'm still not convinced about the liquid. I'm not, I'm not sure about it. I, doesn't, I never hear people sort yeah. of, people haven't told me such great things. I would stick to the powder. Yeah. And anything about mm. uh, bentonite clay and the different... Uh, yeah, I mean, things? it'll do something similar, but some people don't really get on with it, whereas most people get on with zeolite. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I personally, I don't get on with the clay, but some people do. So, but all animals will eat clay. All, all you know, animals that graze will eat clay. Apparently, it's a natural thing for uh, for an animal to do to cleanse themselves. Okay, you got a question over here from uh, Anna. Um, Polly, I'm here. Hello. Oh, I'm right sorry. at the front. Oh. I'm here. <laughs> oh, hi. I'm right here. Hi. It's good to meet you. Last night, by the way. Yeah, we had, a, we had an interesting experience because I, I asked, I said I wanted salad and fruit and then had, we had a bit of a contagion about that, didn't we? we More did. salads and fruit kept appearing. And That's right. Because <laughs> you're like, how do you get that? I'm you asked for a salad. <laughs> exactly. Um, yes, I've been following the raw food path for um, a few years now, so I'm quite tuned into what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, I wanted to um, ask what your view is on seaweed. Um, Kate Magic is mm. um, a great advocate of um, incorporating seaweed, and I've been eating a lot of dulse and um, sea spaghetti. Yeah, I, I, I think love. I think it's really important for a very simple reason that what we're, you think what we're actually doing, we're taking the nutrition from the from the soil, putting it in our bodies, and then flushing it out to sea. <laughs> It's crazy behaviour, but the, the nutrition, there's far more nutrition left in the sea in some regards than the earth, and the, the seaweeds have got minerals in, and especially iodine in. So the food groups I talk about that we need to really eat to get on an op optimal diet, we're getting obviously the fruit and vegetables unprocessed, uncooked, um, seeds, se seeds and a, f a few nuts, but mainly seeds that have been soaked, so they're activated, so they haven't got growth inhibitors in them. And then um, I think for most, most we're going to need fat-soluble vitamins, right? So for most people, that will be some kind of animal product. For others, it will be a bunch of supplements. 
and we need various supplements and superfoods to make up for all the massive deficiencies in the soil, our compromised situation, and the whole world situation. And as the sea, seaweed, seafoods, you know, seaweeds, sea vegetables, and fermented foods, because we're not living close to the earth, we need to get those, um, we need to get these um, bacteria back into our bodies, the beneficial bacteria, good water connection to us. So they're the food groups I talk about. Mm. Definitely sea vegetables. Can I, can I just ask one supplementary yeah, yeah, question? Yeah, yeah. Um, what about the impact of Fukushima on seaweed? Oh, well, I mean, it's, it's tricky, isn't it? Because we're, all, I mean, we're living in a radioactive soup, basically, and an EM soup. I don't know what, what, you know, I suppose you just have to make some kind of sense. Maybe some people are not going to feel they're going to want it from Japan, but maybe from the Atlantic. But it's all, everything's contaminated now. And, you know, people talk about organic, organic food and we've got chemtrails overhead. So we, I think it's best to accept that situation to a certain degree and get as strong as we possibly can. Get our immune systems up. Medicinal mushrooms to get our immune systems up. And this is, we can't mess about now. This is the parting of the ways. You know, things have changed. It's getting very obvious. We're either going to have to get on our act or, you know... <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're going we're gonna to get composted by forces bigger than us or bigger than any on this planet. Do you, do you know what I mean? It's like it's got, we have to live in a way that's viable. And, um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Ariel? Hello, have we got the switch? Hi. Okay, well, m my answer from becoming raw... Mm. Primarily in 2004, I think it was. Mm. I was straight raw, raw wild for four mm. years. Yeah. Uh, is wild plants from the environment? Mm. Uh, so, on an average week, at this point in the season, mm. because wild plants have only come into their own in the, the last month, really. Mm. It's been very late, and the yeah. winter there's nothing. So. Yeah. It, yeah. So, what is your feeling on actual, the gorilla diet where you are? I mean, gorilla, not gorilla. Yeah, I know, well, so I don't think, I think we're away from home. So, I, I think it's like these ideals are all really lovely, but we've got, I, I think we've got a mix. Of, so, we need to think about eating foods, our natural biological foods, and lots of times they're not really where we are. So, I, I'm really open to importing food because, um, this habitat isn't our biological habitat anyway. I agree. Yeah. But we also need the foods local. We need local fresh foods because we need that vitality too. So I think, for me, it's just putting together this whole collage and interweaving mm. of things. We want, la we want you know, as much local natural food as we can get, fresh, really fresh, and then using, bringing in imported things and superfoods to give us the elements that we're not going to get where we are. And... Um, I'm, yeah. ta I'm talking primarily about wild plants growing by themselves in the environment. I think it's really important to get wild food in. I do agree that because they have this fight. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, I think you know you get so you do something for so long you forget why this is actually really important to you. Yeah, absolutely, and it's a connection. It's actually having that connection to the plant itself as well that we need. Yeah. Okay, you've got a question at the back of the room, Penny. Oh, thanks a lot. Can you hear? Thanks, Holly. I, you you spoke at the only AV conference I didn't go to. <laughs> um, brilliant, because we are what we eat and what we drink and so on. I just yeah. wondered if it's okay to ask you if it's all right to just emphasise, and I have a flyer on it, about the importance of the sea salt. It actually expands your consciousness. Yeah. And I've got a feeling that the Essenes live by the Dead Sea, and I've got an Essene symbol on this uh, glass pendant, which actually, yeah, um, yeah and the, the Dead Sea salt expanded mm. the consciousness. And the Himalayan rock crystal, mm. Christ all, salt. The messages in the word sal was a Latin name for salt. Right. And salve, salvation, salary, we're paid in salt. And it's so important. And what are we having on the table in the restaurant? And it's a lot of places. Is you, you, think, I call it you think there's the lunch in the salt. restaurant? We've <laughs> the we poison changed salt. plans, yeah, Penny. Yeah. We've changed plans. Lunch is in the 92 oh, yeah, no, acres. Sorry, I'm thinking last <laughs> yes, night. Exactly. <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and just let's have us a quick. Like the l the last one is about Epsom salts, your magnesium. The, the heart needs it, and we are. Uh, we, we definitely need a lot of magnesium. Yeah, go in a flotation mm. tank. I've got a flyer on that about mm. go floating. It's a thousand pounds of magnesium sulfate. Yeah. Actually, Epsom salts and dissolved, and you're floating, and you're taking mm. it to the skin, and it's fantastic. Mm. But I thought what you were talking about Thank is you. super fantastic. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Well, bring the microphone down to Clive here, please. Going off here that I know people's names. <laughs> Hello, Holly. Hi. Um, you keep talking about us moving away from the tropics, but mm. I'm not sure how much you're aware because I'm aware you're limiting your talk. Um, the Thunderbolt project talks about. I know about the Thunderbolts project. Yeah, yeah. About the whole planet solar system being rearranged, mm -hmm. and there was a concept in there that the whole planet was more tropical at one yeah, point. Yeah, I, I, I know about that, yeah. So... Yeah, I, I, think, it's, I think it's totally... This it, is totally in alignment with this way of thinking. Yeah. The even seasons. Yeah. And the ability for more different plants to grow wherever we were. Yeah, yeah. so we, we didn't leave. The, they took our... So they took our... You know... Our went away from yeah, us. Yeah, I mean, I, I, for me, I, d I have no way of knowing exactly what happened, except we're just out of our natural habitat. And I agree with you. I think, I think that might well be what happened. I do really believe... I, do, I think the electric universe theory is much more accurate than anything else we're told at the moment. And, yeah, I yeah. agree. Yeah, I agree. We don't know what happened, mm. but something did. Yeah. But, yeah, and it could be, like you said, yeah. Uh, to Bob? Paul? Just... Uh, no, this way, this way? Oh, OK. Coming to Bob next, and then to Les. Hello? Yeah. Um, I buy most of my vitamins, etc., from Holland and Barrett's. Yeah. Um, do you believe this is a re honest and re reliable source? Well, well done for actually, you know, doing it. That actually bothering to get supplements is my first thought. Do you, do you know what I mean? And they probably are better sources. You know, you probably find better stuff. You know, they probably aren't the best source of... I mean, I'm, I, there's certain places you can get stuff now. Um, I mean, if, you, if there's specific things you want to source, um, I'm happy to advise you. I mean, not, not, they won't all be from my site. They're from a variety of places. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't imagine that they're the best source for everything. Um, don't really know what else to say, really. Um, You notice that Holland and Barrett, all their toothpastes are now starting to have fluoride added. Yeah. Mm. Bob? Yeah, great talk, Holly. Um, on, on the Holland and Barrett thing, I went in there recently to buy some milk thistle. But I looked at the ingredients and, and, um, and the way that they had it actually extracted mm. the substance. And the product that they used stop me from buying it. Mm. So I, I had to look somewhere else and, and find a better source. I also think they're a bit expensive. However, mm, yeah, definitely. You mentioned, you've mentioned uh, fermented mm. food several times. Yeah. Are, are you talking about kimchi and yeah, uh, that sauerkraut? Kind of fermented, yeah, uh, yeah. Are there any others that you can recommend? And any kefir. Other? Ka Sorry? You know, kefir. Do you know, have you heard of kefir? kefir yeah. 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 Oh, it's ke I have to say it wrong, I think. It's an old habit, but kefir. Kefir, yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I think... <laughs> It's, this, it's, the, it's to do with the internal ecology because, you know, it's like, like the Earth is one being but loads of different individuals on it. Our bodies are the same and we've actually got more, um, what you call microorganisms inside us and we've got cells in our body. We're actually a whole ecology. And when you get, start to get that um, more how it should be, um, the immune system improves, all kinds of conditions improve and we feel a lot better. It's a whole chemical factory going on in, in there, really. So I think, personally, I think kefir is the most powerful one um, for, uh, for resetting the system. And there's also, you've got the benefits of lots of B vitamins in it, especially the milk kefir, B vitamins and A and D and so forth, and tryptophan. Um, but the fermented vegetables, some people don't get on with it anyway or don't want to have it, but fermented vegetables, they will produce a lot, they will bring a lot of um, my, uh, microorganisms to the body that are beneficial, yeah. It's it's I think it's essential, really, to have fermented foods at least once a day. Is that kefir, mm. K-E-F-I-R? K-E-F-I-R, yeah, and there's Thank water you. kefir, milk kefir, yeah. Um, down to Les, can you, can you reach Les here? Any other questions? 
Okay, we'll get a couple more. Uh, right, thank you. Um, with relation to what's in our food nowadays, obviously our agricultural land has been totally depleted of tr mm. a lot of trace elements, yeah, minerals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is a book called We Want Real Food. I forget who it's by. Well, I've heard of it. I can't think either. Uh, also, is this on? Yeah. Mm. Um, up near Pitlochry, there is a, a quarry mm. that sells rock dust, which yeah. is the, the dust and chippings of the yeah, rock yeah. Dig quarry. Yeah. Now, when this is mixed with either compost or, or you know, dung from the farms, mm. um, it releases all the trace elements yeah. and minerals back yeah, into yeah. the soil. Now, I bought a ton of this stuff mm. and put some on my brother's allotment, mm. and that first year, the carrots, for mm. the first time in decades, yeah. smelt and taste like yeah, proper yeah. carrots. Yeah. And also, one of the beetroots must have had an extra big feed of the stuff because one beetroot weighed 12 pound, 10 <laughs> ounces. I've got a photograph of me <laughs> holding somewhere. <laughs> Absolutely unbelievable. <laughs> but I think if we could get the farmers to yeah. use this uh, rock dust yeah. on the farm, on the farmland, mm. then we would be getting back everything yeah. we need into and the food. And you do it with seaweed as well, getting seaweed yeah. back on the land, because then bring some of that back from the... The only thing that bothers me about seaweed oh, is all the muck we've been generating for hundreds of years since the Industrial Revolution has been going to our streams, into the rivers, now it's into the seas, including everything from the humans, yeah, human I waste. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, I can recommend the Pitlockery rock diet. And <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to have to uh, call it time on there. Um, Holly, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Now, hang on, hang on. Ho Holly's going to offer a workshop, aren't yeah. you? On Monday? I can do, yes, oh, I, I, you... I, I, I really... Oh, OK. I, mean, <laughs> I, know, I can don't, do. don't want to put you on the spot. I know, well, I can do, yes, okay. I will do, I will do. I, mean, I thought you said I will you do. Okay. I couldn't remember what I said, but I will do. OK, well, no. <laughs> OK, so let me remind no. you what you said. You said, I'd love to do a workshop. Did I? Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no pressure. <laughs> no, I really would like to. Okay. I mean, what happened, to be absolutely honest, what happened is my, my, uh, my children got their GCSEs coming in. They want me to do maths tutorial with them. And actually, the programme here is so amazing. I actually feel that rather than go back on Sunday, I've really got to stay. Because it is really, that's really, really what I was thinking. So, you know, do you know what I mean? OK, well, uh, you yeah. think about it. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, if, you, if you do want to... I have to think about, okay. I've, you know, it's you a crisis of conscious... I understand. Yeah, conscious. consciousness. Yes. Yeah, because of what do you do about GCSE maths? Yeah. That's the <laughs> well, that's a whole other debate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you okay. so much, Holly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>